Now, as I said before, I would just like to give the floor to Maria Nicolci now for to, to discuss, to, to, to commence the uh, first panel discussion with her esteemed participants. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Uh, dear all, Professor, it's a great honor uh, for me being here with you, uh, such a wonderful and important ladies. Uh, without further delay, I would like to ask to take their seats in the panel, uh, Mrs. Eli Tritopoulou, President of the Greek Women's Engineering Association, EDEM. Glikeria Hutis, Professor of Public Law and Environmental Law, National and Capodistrian University of Athens, and also she's a co-founder and managing partner at Flogaitis Hutis and Partners Law Firm. Perfect. Mrs. Athena Hadzipetrou, she is the former CEO of Hellenic Development Bank. Ακούγεται λίγο βαριά, να μου πάρετε λίγο τα μπάσα. Sorry, I will say it in English now. It's a live program. Είναι καλύτερα λίγο τώρα, λίγο τα μπάσα. Thank you, great. Let me carry on. Uh, Mrs. Evgenia Giannini is an Associate Professor of Technical Law at National and Technical University of Athens. Uh, Mrs. Irene Notias will be late. We will join her later. And Mrs. Laurie McNeil, International Media Marketing and Branding Expert. Is everybody here with us? Great. And let me give the floor to our keynote speaker, Mrs. Sofia Kunenake Fremoglu. She is the president of the Athens Chamber of Commerce and Industry. The floor is yours for the next seven minutes, please. Dear presidents. Dear presidents, uh, dear speakers, distinguished guests, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this important discussion. Today, we are talking about the contribution of women entrepreneurs to sustainable development. The fact that we are having this discussion reflects the progress made in recent years in recognizing women's leadership. Not long ago, we were still debating whether women could survive and succeed in the business world. Now, we are increasingly focusing on the value women can add to businesses, economies, and societies. And this is beneficial, not just for women, but for our world as a whole. The 2023 UN report shows that progress on over half of the goals is insufficient and slow. By 2030, 575 million people will still be in extreme poverty and only one third of the countries will be able to cut their poverty rates in half. Achieving gender equality may take at least 286 years. The UN Secretary General has called for urgent action to realign efforts towards meeting the SDGs. In this effort, the role of the private sector is crucial and women entrepreneurs can play a significant and multifaceted role. This is firstly because women's entrepreneurship in itself empowers millions of women economically and contributes to poverty reduction in many parts of the world. It creates income and employment opportunities, promotes equality, and benefits individuals, families, and local communities. Secondly, businesses led by women tend to perform very well in terms of sustainable development. Studies have shown that women entrepreneurs are more aware of how their activities and choices impact local communities. That's why women often choose to undertake initiatives at the local level, creating businesses that utilize local resources and human capital. We have seen this in practice in Greece, 
through the National Chamber Network of Women Entrepreneurs. Furthermore, according to a study published in the International Journal of Business Governance and Ethics, women are more likely to consider the rights of others and adopt a more collaborative approach to decision making. The same study reveals that women in leadership positions tend to make decisions that take into account the interest of multiple stakeholders leading to fairer outcomes. Women entrepreneurs bring not only creativity, innovation, and talent to the economy, but also support the transition to a new model of business leadership. They express a purpose-driven entrepreneurship one that doesn't end with profit making for shareholders, but includes creating value for society, contributing positively to addressing common challenges. That is why we have every reason to continue our efforts to strengthen women's entrepreneurship and encourage women to gain more confidence, to trust in their own leadership style and choices, rather than trying to conform to outdated stereotypes. This is a battle we continue to fight, both at the Athens Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the National Chamber Network of Women Entrepreneurs through developing a three-pronged strategy to help women break barriers and succeed in business. The first focus of our strategy is on reskilling and upskilling women, ensuring they are not left behind in the ongoing digital transformation. To address this, we launched the Empowering Unemployed Women Over 35 Years of Age, a pilot program in collaboration with Microsoft Alas, aimed at providing essential knowledge and skills to women seeking new employment opportunities or career changes. The program includes seminars and coaching sessions in order to help participants navigate the job market and develop confidence. Next month, we will start a new cycle. In addition to this, we are also running a national program for 5,300 young unemployed women, providing them with training in fields such as new technologies, finance, virtual reality, and green energy, areas where women are often underrepresented. The second axis of our strategy is focused on increasing women's participation in the technology sector. Recognizing the immense economic potential of gender equality in business, the National Chamber Network of Women Entrepreneurs, at the yeah, as we say it in Greek, is actively participating in the Women's Innovation Center that the minister mentioned, uh, where uh, we work to increase women's presence in STEM fields and entrepreneurship. Studies have shown that if women participated in business on an equal footing with men, global GDP would increase by 3% to 6%, adding about $2.5 to $6 trillion in production and value. Other studies have shown that gender equality in business would add nearly 300 million new jobs. Projecting these numbers to the Greek economy, we would, we would be talking about an extra 12 billion euros to our GDP. That is why the third axis of our strategy is centered on encouraging women-led startups. Despite the increasing role of women in entrepreneurship, women founders still make up only 15% of the total and just 2% of these have access to investment capital. So we at the Athens Chamber of uh, uh, Commerce and Industry, we offer incubation facilities to women entrepreneurs providing space, but also legal and financial advice, business planning, and access to networking opportunities to help secure capital. Our incubator is the largest in Greece, uh, and by now we have supported 30 uh, in the two years that uh, we have started. Uh, we have supported 30 women-led startups, 
and we are currently working to assist another 20. Additionally, we are committed to exposing women-led startups to international investors by uh, including them to global events such as the Libo Lisbon Web Summit, the Mobile World Congress in uh, Barcelona, Collision in Canada. Um, we have uh, around seven uh, free of charge to the Innovation Forum in Sardinia at the end of this month. And um, uh, recently, we launched the Greek chapter of uh, Prospera Women from Silicon Valley at the Athens Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Moreover, we systematically promote the equal participation of women in corporate boards, focusing particularly on small and medium-sized enterprises and family businesses, providing practical guidance and encouragement for, for promoting diversity and equality. And we are ready to support the increase of women's representation on the boards of listed companies to 33%. Now it's, the law is 25, and it's actually 27, uh, in line with a recent EU directive. You see, increasing the participation of women in entrepreneurship and the economy is not just a matter of fairness. It is essential for unlocking a wealth of untapped talent, skills, and innovative ideas that have long been underutilized. Empowering women entrepreneurs is a critical driver for achieving sustainable, equitable, and inclusive growth. It's not just about giving, giving women a seat at the table, but about reshaping the table itself, fostering a future where businesses thrive and societies flourish through shared prosperity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much again for the invitation. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, dear President. Just before leaving, uh, let me call you Mrs. Samoili. Thank you. Thank you very much. The president has a strict program today. That's why she has to leave. Nasta kala, brother. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one hour and a half at our disposal, so I'll give the floor to each of you for, let's say, up to seven minutes in order to have time for a short discussion after. And uh, let me start with the president of Greek Women Engineering Association, Mrs. Efi Tritopoulou. I'm very happy, very glad to meet you because my son just entered the university in order to become an engineer, a mechanical engineer. So it's very important for me to see so many successful women engineers. Uh, dear president, the floor is yours. Well, good success to your son. You. My son is also coming the first year in chemical engineering at NTUA. Oh, so the family of uh, engineers are growing up. So um, I have a presentation. Let me take my oh. move here in order for you to have your space. Uh, is it easy to have the presentation? OK, thank you. Great. Okay, uh, well, uh, I'm, to, I'm uh, here like the president of uh, Greek Women's Engineering Association. So let me talk about uh, the organization. Uh, we are established in... Uh, oh. Sorry. So uh, we are established in 1995, and we have approximately 1,500 members, all qualified women engineers, members, of course, of the Technical uh, Chamber of uh, Greece. 
Our main purposes are to face gender stereotypes, to perform mentoring and training to enhance women engineers' chance of employment, cooperate with other organizations and public bodies with our institutional role, and to encourage and promote activities of women engineers beyond their professional sphere, like artistic and cultural activities and other initiatives. Uh, ADEM is also participating to networks and associations which promote uh, gender equality, like uh, WITEC, We Mentor, and uh, the European uh, Platform of uh, Women Scientists. Uh, about uh, the, per the percentage of uh, women, uh, Professor uh, Moropoulou mentioned before that uh, we started uh, with a low ratio in the first years, but after 2006, the percentage remains uh, something after 30%, as it is now also. Uh, ADEM uh, participates to a lot of European projects. I have highlighted with uh, Red One uh, projects uh, uh, about gender and environment and entrepreneurship. Okay, and the challenge uh, today and in our discussion is how we can um, uh, enter, how we can uh, enter the gender dimension and the gender equality and the promotion of uh, <coughs> women entrepreneurship in order to achieve the environmental goals that EU strategies like Green Deal, Circular Economy, and the Sustainable Development Goals uh, uh, perform. So gender equality is a central uh, pillar for achieving sustainable development. Companies with uh, improved gender diversity were 60% more likely to reduce energy consumption, 40% greenhouse gas emission, and 46% water use. This all because women are more sensitive and environmental awakening and distribute more in uh, the protection of environment due to their personality characteristics, their social role, behavior, their way of growing up, and also the active role in the housing. Uh, Finland and Sweden achieving gender balance at the highest level, with women and men nearly equally presented within ministries and other committees, while in the European Union, uh, in 2014, women represented 28% of senior ministers. Here we can see the participation of women in R&D, in research and development activities, and we can see that uh, in Greece we have a good performance in this indicator, meaning that we have a lot of women holding a PhD. And most, uh, they are active in uh, social sciences, humanities and arts, agricultural, sciences and medicine. I, according to a study of uh, ICAP, uh, women entrepreneurs in Greece are constantly increasing uh, of about being today 25%, uh, while in Europe this is 30%. But the most important is, as it is mentioned already uh, before, that uh, women bring uh, a lot of benefits and uh, w uh, <coughs> companies that are leading from women, as we can see with the green, having uh, more profitability ratios in all indicators and more in cross profit. So, uh, why? to choose women in leadership. Why, uh, what makes them more spe uh, special? Because they have the ability for multitasking, to do a lot of things in the same time. Because they have strong communication skills, uh, high empathy and emotional intelligence, perseverance and hard work, diversity of thought and perspective, environmental consciousness, innovation in their services and products, and extroversion, as we can see the diagram, because uh, women entrepreneurship in Greece present a lot of uh, share of export compared to other EU countries and the EU uh, 
ratio. So, uh, how we can enhance this uh, perspective, the women entrepreneurship? Uh, investing in policies in order to have the work-life balance, reduce the bureaucracy and the gender stereotypes, networking and uh, access to information, uh, with mentoring and sharing uh, best practices, access to funding for women entrepreneurs, promote an entrepreneur culture with education from starting from the young uh, years, development of financial, uh, financial instruments that value companies in correlation with their contribution to society, environment, and gender perspective, and promote alternative business models like uh, cooperatives. So, thank you, and I remain here for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I, I will have a question later. Actually, I was watching this movie, this series on Netflix, Outlander, and uh, the, um, the daughter of the main character, back to 40s, 50s, she used to be a mechanical engineer in a big barrier. And no man would accept her as mechanical engineer in such a great uh, Barrier, dam, I don't know how do you call it. How do you call it? Fragma, the big dam. Later, I will ask you if this perception uh, has really changed in these big projects. But later, it uh, will be one of my questions. Let me call now to the floor Mrs. Ligeria Sutis, Professor of Public Law and Environmental Law in National and Capodistrian University of Athens. And of course, she's a co-founder and managing partner at Flogaitis Sutis and Partners Law Firm. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm going to speak uh, yeah, for yeah. the panel. Whatever is better for you. Up well, to seven minutes, up please. seven minutes, yes. Uh, I'm very happy to be here among you. Um, I think that uh, the subject of our uh, conference is really very intriguing, <coughs> always uh, <laughs> modern. Uh, before beginning, I would like uh, to welcome here with us uh, a real uh, leadership, uh, a real female leadership in the High Administrative Court of Greece. We have among us Mrs. Sisi Chrysikopoulou, who is Vice Pre President yeah, of the of Council of State. Yeah, <laughs> it's an honor having you with us. Now, uh, women's uh, female leadership and uh, sustainable development. The, the first thing I, I would like to mention is that the European Parliament and the Council and the European Council have adopted since 2022, a directive on improving the gender balance among directors of the so-called listed companies and related measures. This directive aims to achieve a more balanced representation of women among the directors of listed companies by establishing effective measures that aim to accelerate progress towards gender balance while allowing listed companies sufficient time to make the necessary arrangements for that purpose. Which is the notion of listed companies? Listed companies means a company which has its registered office in a member state and whose shares are admitted to training, to trading on a regulated market in one or more member states. It is evident that this directive aims directly at the top, does not apply to micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, and its main objective is, is to reach gender balance on boards. It is common knowledge that the European Union has a large pool of highly qualified women which is constantly growing. 60% of the university graduates are female. In the same time, the under-representation of women in BODs is the result of unequal opportunities between women and men, and so the directive aims 
at ensuring a set of procedural requirements concerning the selection of candidates for appointment or election to director positions based on transparency and merit. In its conclusions, since March 2011, on European Pact for Gender Equality, the Council, the European Council, acknowledged that gender equality policies are vital to economic growth, prosperity, and competitiveness. Also, in its communication of March 2010, entitled Europe 2020, a strategy for smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth, the European Commission recognized that increasing women's labor market participation is a precondition for boosting growth. It is important that a clear commitment be made to eliminate the persisting gender pay gap and that a reinforced effort be made to overcome all barriers to women's participation in the labor market, including the existing so-called glass ceiling phenomenon. But which is the rightful realm of men, of women? Is it home or not? The metaphors concrete wall, glass ceiling, and labyrinth mean that women have considerably more access to lower level uh, leadership positions while they often remain excluded from most positions in the highest level of politics, the economy, and in general society. This applies especially in that uh, stereotypes continue to play in both a conscious and unconscious way, important roles in the context of women's positional leadership. Positional leadership defines a person who exercises authority over other people by occupying both formal and informal positions within groups, organizations, and institutions, by participating in the decision-making by imposing rules and limitations, and by giving orders, guidance, and interpretation. Crucial is also the reciprocal relation between leaders and followers. Do people like accept women as leaders? The stereotypes still favor the masculine leadership. Moreover, the extent to which leadership can be exercised depends not only on individual capacities, but also on the institutional as well as situational opportunities and constraints on a given office. Now, as for the uh, special subject of the promotion of sustainability and female leadership, Findings suggest that firms characterized by gender diverse leadership teams are more effective than other firms at pursuing environmentally friendly strategies. Women are more likely to implement long-term strategies and outcomes which take into account the interests of all parties and while more cautious in making investment decisions, are more tended to adopt uh, long-term results and stakeholder-oriented strategies which may contribute to the success of environmental practices um, and enhance positively the company's environmental performance. There is a growing number of publications and studies uh, since 2011 that there is a strong relationship between gender diversity and environmental performance and that the presence of women on corporate boards impacts significantly the firms or the enterprises both sustainable, develop, uh, sustainable investment and environmental performance. The studies have shown that cognitive patterns which determine the manager's willingness to engage in environmental innovation characterizes strongly female leadership. Female directors have a high tendency to protect environmental ethics, to enhance significant companies' awareness of environmental and social issues, and promote the adoption of positive strategies to respond 
to corporate social and ethical demands. Thus, the company's environmental consciousness and sustainability increase. Especially, there is a greater sensitivity towards climate change, which characterizes female directors and which translates into concrete actions, among which the impact of green information of companies or firms' value within a regulatory context is not negligible. Companies are not functioning in a neutral social sphere. They are complex and interconnected entities. Sustained profitability is regarded as one of the most important financial indicators of a company's growth prospects. We must never forget that since the famous Brutland Report and Agenda 21, sustainability or sustainable development is understood as the development which, by being environmental friendly, does not exhaust natural, natural resources, thus rendering economic growth viable, sustainable. Thus, green strategies are more effectively achieved in companies with strong female leadership teams, which prove to perform a more experienced in community and service performance, thus achieving in the same time their company's financial viability. As for the female behavioral leadership, in opposition to the positional leadership, this last characteristic, which is named behavioral leadership, means that women practice le different leadership styles than men. The stereotype of leadership is usually accepted as masculinity, meaning dominance, authority, and ambition. In the same time, women leaders are more participatory, democratic, and interpersonally sensitive. Their effectiveness and their leadership performance need to be considered from a functional point of view, which must be viewed rather as a social construction. Concluding, either as positional or behavioral leaders, Female leaders in all levels, political, administrative, and expert offices, are of course largely determined at member states level, but in general still encounter the usual barriers in leadership positions. Women are well represented in the medium level, but not in the highest level as committee chairs, presidents of party groups, EU offices, universities, bar associations. Even in the European Commission, with some few exceptions, are mostly charged with soft portfolios, such as education, social policy, and environmental policy. In the European Court of Justice, there is a steady increase in female judges and advocate generals, and the positional leadership of, of women in the European Union has significantly improved in recent years. Yet, a fair gender balance and diversity in high-level positions have not yet been reached. The factors are manifold. Traditional gender regimes, lack of consistent gender policies, and the still prevalent view that women are less suited than men to performing leadership functions. The best is yet to come. Thank you, thank you, dear professor. And now let me give the floor to my great friend and former CEO of the Greek Development Bank, Mrs. Athena Hadzipetrou. Dear Hadzipetrou, the floor is yours. Presentation. Presentation, yeah. yes. Okay, okay. And then to click. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, dear president of ACCA, dear friend and uh, te, uh, professor Tonya Moropoulou, today we stand at the intersection of innovation, sustainability and leadership, a place where women entrepreneurs shine brightly 
and their role in promoting sustainable development is not just important, it's vital. Women entrepreneurs can redefine what it means to lead in business and create a profound impact on environmental sustainability. By prioritizing environmental and social responsibility, they are leveraging innovative approaches to create business that not only generate profit, but also address some of the most pressing global challenges of our time. From climate change to poverty alleviation, women pave the way for a more sustainable future. Social responsibility is another cornerstone of their ventures. Women entrepreneurs are often at the forefront of initiatives that promote social equity, enhance community development, and ensure fair labor practices. As role models and trailblazers, they inspire future generations to embrace entrepreneurship with a sense of purpose and a commitment to sustainability. Let's address some of the key facts and drivers. Okay. Αυτό. Ποιο? Αυτό δεν το πόντε. Μας προηγηθείς τα λίγα και έλα από εδώ, δεν πειράζει. It's a live program, so we can arrange. Προχώρησε. Ωραία. Τέλεια. Of course, we always need sometimes a little bit of men. That's always true. Now, according to the United States, uh, uh, nations are all, uh, also heard uh, from previous speeches, speakers, achieving gender equality and empowering women and girls is integrated to each of the 17 sustainable development goals. But as you see here, following the pace that we have currently, we will achieve these targets by 2086 and not 2030. Women entrepreneurs are active agents of change to achieve these goals by 2030, whereas the current pace is rather discouraging. What we need is to articulate a clear vision and to ensure that we fill the need without crowding out existing sources and policies. And this aspiration can be broader and include maximizing socioeconomic outcomes such as job creations or economic growth, improving the environment by investing in specific industries such as energy, transport or water, and uh, other similar uh, industries, and last but not least, mobilizing more private sector financing. Some other facts. Rapiga piso. To megalo. Tora? Pusa nai to megalo tos to kilo. Alexe? Telia. Libon. What we see here is an impressive chart. Why? Because Europe, as you see, lags behind East Asia as well as Latin America. Women in low-income countries had the highest entrepreneurial intentions, while those in high-income countries were least likely to want to start a business. Let's see why this disparity in entrepreneurial intentions between low-income and high-income countries is caused. We can attribute this to several fact factors. One is economic necessity. In low-income countries, women often turn to entrepreneurship out of necessity due to limited job opportunities and economic instability. And this necessity-driven entrepreneurship is a key motivator for starting businesses. Another cause is the access to resources. Women in low-income countries may have fewer resources and support system, which can drive them to create their own opportunities through entrepreneurship. Third factor is cultural and social norms. In some low-income countries, the society expects women to contribute economically, leading to higher entrepreneurial intentions. Four, risk tolerance. Women in low-income countries might have a higher tolerance for risk, as the potential rewards of entrepreneurship can be significant in improving their economic situation. And also, um, what is important is support programs, because most uh, big organizations have support programs for these low-income uh, regions. So more targeted support programs and initiatives in low-income countries aimed at fostering entrepreneurship among women. Conversely, in high-income countries, job security, which means higher job and more stable employment opportunities, can reduce the need for women to start their own business. Likewise, access to resources, entrepreneurship is less of a necessity and more of a choice. 
Risk aversion, which is also important, losing, let's say, what we already have gained as society. Higher income levels and more stable economic conditions can lead to greater risk aversion, making women less likely to pursue entrepreneurship. Fourth is the cultural and social norms. Existing opportunities with more established business and industries, there may be fewer gaps in the market for new ventures, leading to lower entrepreneurial intentions. These above factors collectively contribute to the higher entrepreneurial intentions among women in low-income countries compared to their counterparts in high-income countries. Another fancy fact, as we see here, funds invested in startups founded or co-founded by women garner less in investments but generate more revenue. And as the figure below illustrates, once women led startups and uh, SMEs dispose of enough financial means, the return on investment exceeds the average. Conversely, if women were earning as much as men, human capital wealth could increase by about one-fifth globally. It was already mentioned by a previous speaker. I want to, to make some proposals and probably Maria will be part of the discussion. So some of the solutions, some of the solutions to overcome and to boost, let's say, entrepreneurship, female entrepreneurship, instead of focusing on high growth firms, rather support women-owned SMEs in growth-oriented sectors. What we see is that um, significant gender differences in firm size and access to finance are both a cause and a result of their representation. The more profitable um, and the fewer profitable is a sector, the fewer business owners has. And um, women entrepreneurs are underrepresented in high profit uh, industries where are overrepresented in low level jobs. This um, uh, leads us into strengthening measures to support market entry and business growth into these high growth sectors. And we need to support, and this is why we are here, networking and role models so as women will follow and will uh, address and uh, um, uh, thrive into sectors that are really making now or will make money in the future. Second is when supporting women-owned SMEs, holistic multi-level approach is desirable, which means not just grants, not just education, not just um, providing, let's say, resources into any kind of uh, random industry that we call female entrepreneurship. Um, third is the climate change strengthening women. Um, already, and as mentioned also by co-fellows here, um, the share of women in the renewable energy sector workforce is already higher in the, than in the fossil fuel sector, which means that women are already targeting um, uh, sectors that are uh, sustainable, um, part of the sustainability. To, um, what we see, though, in order to bridge the gap that was already mentioned in terms of jobs, we need to foster the participation of women in those jobs that will create 100 million positions and a net amount of 20 million jobs by 2030. And these jobs, the majority of these jobs, will be created in male-dominant sectors. Mitigation policies. Um, we pass that here. Now, mitigation policies that will promote female entrepreneurship is access to finance, training and mentorship, policy frameworks, supportive legislation, breaking gender norms already passed here, promoting positive roles and models and success stories of women entrepreneurs, inclusive disaster risk reduction, and these policies are aimed to create a more supportive and inclusive environment for female entrepreneurship, primarily in the uh, regions that we see that we don't dare in entrepreneurship. Women are more focused on having jobs, low-paid jobs, or not touching the entrepreneurship. In conclusion, 
Women entrepreneurs play a pivotal role in shaping a sustainable future, and as role models and trailblazers, they inspire future generations to embrace entrepreneurship with a sense of purpose and a commitment to sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Hadzipetru. And now let me give the floor to Evgenia Eugenia Giannini, Associate Professor of Technical Law at the National Technical University of Athens. Oh, really? Okay, uh, sorry, I, I haven't seen the message. Mrs. Notias is here? Yes? Okay, let me give you the floor now. Founder and Director, Project Connect. Managing Director, Prime Managing Services. Please, the floor is yours, or Thank you very if it's much. better for you there. Thank, Thank you. you. I literally flew in from Athens, Greece this morning, and I had a cab pick me up and uh, waited but, for me but to But you did it. Address. You managed it. I made it. I made it's it. fine. Uh, the plane actually was 20 minutes early, but the traffic from the airport to Glifada was another 40 minutes. It, that was the weirdest thing. So I'm very happy to be here, and thank you very much. Uh, it was kind of last minute for me to be invited, and I never knew that uh, WEF existed, Women Economic Forum, because I belong to the shipping industry, and I belong to the Women in International Shipping and Trading Association in Greece and, and the International. And um, I can honestly say I'm, I'm here as a role model right now because I don't have a speech to say or a preparation except for the businesses that I've had created. Uh, Ms. Stella Kokolis, who is here, was, um, she knows me from a young girl in Holy Cross Church in, Greek, in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. I was born in Athens. My parents took me to America. My mother actually took me to America by herself. 1962, I was five, month, five months old, and I became naturalized when she became a citizen at seven years old. And I went back, I got the chills now, I went back just now after two years of not being there. My father, who worked very, very hard with my mother to leave us a home in Brooklyn, I went back to see the home. And I saw a lot of my friends, all women friends, who are all accomplished. We are raised in the church community, in Holy Cross, uh, any church community, uh, to be strong women, to work for the community, to create. But I want to say something also. In Manhattan, I was at, at, at a function for the Hellenic, um, but it was Hellenic something 10 years ago with Angeliki Frangu, Navios. And she, was, she invited me there. It was, and somebody said, economy, economa, economa, yelinida, yelinida, right? Ancient Greek woman was the economa of the house. And I, that has stuck to me. I didn't have children. I was married, but I never had children. And um, I always said, women who have children and work are heroes of the world, super women and heroes. And why? Because, and they are the CEOs of the world. They are chief economists of their house, right? C-E-O-H. And I don't hear enough of that. I keep hearing about Sana Masteligo nagging because we don't have enough um, equality and payment and all that stuff. Yes, yes. But we know that we can all do it. And this is my third business in Greece. Um, in America, I changed my father's shoe repair shop into, a, into Cosadino's boutique because I didn't want my father to be working uh, till 76 years old to raise us, to help us. So it is economic how we create something. He had the store, so I said, let me start a, a boutique because I had worked in a boutique. So you have to have expertise, you have to not have know-how, know -how, and you have to be smart in how you can start a business. That's one thing. That was eight years where I got my PhD in the business because my father and my mother were telling me, Mi jalas lefta pola yena penis akrivaruja kenta pula sekerena paris pio economica. Translated in English, please. <laughs> we have a, my an English audience. My, parents, my father was a businessman, and my mother was very commercially in, inclined, and she was a housewife. But she said, I mean, don't buy for your boutique such expensive clothing. I had my dream. I was 24 years old, and I was saying, oh, I want a specialty store with very fancy dresses, because I was like thinking all these things. Eight years of being in a business, getting my PhD there, because trial and error, right? We learn this in school, but unless we practice it, we really don't know it. I mean, we can study it. Which brings me to my current businesses in Greece. Um, because I had shipping background, 
and I worked as a secretary in a shipping company in, in America. When I came to Greece, I found much more easily a, com a company. I, I found myself in a shipping company. I was 34 years old. I wanted to try living in Greece. I worked in a shipping company, and then in four years, I was like 39, 40, I started my own business in the fuel business. Uh, we Just like your car needs gas, the ships need fuel. So I was active in that. But why am I saying that? Because I sacrificed. I didn't have children to do this. And I know that if I had children, I wouldn't be able to do this 24-7 business, nor would I be able to create Project Connect, which also required a lot of my time and take care of my mother at the same time, which I think all of us here have these, have these experiences. Uh, <clears throat> Project Connect, which is the most recent business that I have, is actually matching shipping talent, young professionals in the making, to shipping companies directly with a CV platform that was created by me and my staff in um, 2015. And we have lots of success stories where young women and men found jobs because they were selected from this platform, which now has developed from just a CV platform to an HR recruiting tool, which I want to bring into the other industries also. Because in this HR recruiting tool called CV Platform, I've connected 90 shipping companies, which were my customers when I was selling fuel, which was just a year ago. And I um, took advantage of the clients that I knew and invited them to become members of Project Connect. And what it is is Connect, a lot of young people think that they can't get jobs because they don't have the connection to get into shipping, which might have been true in the past, but it isn't anymore because really it should be, it, it is with such criteria that is like demanding. You have to have, you have to be able to be patient and demand and, and reach the demands in shipping when you're working because uh, you're following the vessel. You're not following a human being only, you're following the job of a vessel, which is transporting every single thing that we have in this, even our clothing, our glasses, everything is transported by ships. So women who are in shipping have very demanding jobs, 24-7, 365. It's funny, one of my friends in, in Brooklyn, Yasu, in Brooklyn, New York, was telling me, yeah, come on, 24-7, weekends, you have weekends. No, I don't have weekends. Anybody who sells fuel or provides for ships or is a captain, a crew is working round the clock because the ships don't stop. Which brings me to one last thing, so I won't take up more of your time. From Project Connect with the CV platform, something fell into my lap from Cyprus, from the CIMEPA people, which is a Cyprus Environmental Marine Protection Association, which was started in Greece with Helmepa. And all over the world, we have environmental protection agencies that are geared with shipping where a crew is very careful not to pollute the, the seas with fuel or even dumping the garbage. So CIMEPA is created uh, with the Cyprus Chamber of Shipping, a program called Adopt a Ship. This was an American idea, which did not uh, go through in the 1930s because the captain stopped uh, writing letters to the children. But what it is is we match a vessel, a seafaring vessel, to a classroom. This is perfection. This is a diamond of an educational tool that we adopted also at Project Connect and we've infiltrated in the Greek education system. And we have about 165 classes uh, the educators have, have uh, enrolled. And we find the, the vessel, we match it with our ship, shipping owner members who are a part of us. And um, the, the educator, uh, the educator, um, uh, draws the classroom's attention to write their first letter. And the children, eight years old up until 12, this is for elementary, junior high, and we just created two years now, Epal Kirei Kerameos, the Ministry of Edu Minister of Education, Mrs. Kerameos, two, two years ago, encouraged us to put this program into the uh, vocational, nautical vocational schools, which are high school students who study, for, uh, study to become ship, uh, ship uh, captains and whatnot. So, um, it's a fantastic uh, program, uh, which is just letter writing, where kids learn how to write English letters. It's all in English. Some Greek teachers want to do it in Greek, and I reprimand them for that, because it has to be, shipping is, English is the shipping language, uh, international language. So they're learning sh uh, English writing. They're learning empathy, which is very much needed for young people. Empathy for the crew, because they realize from the crew's letters that 
the, captain, the captain's letters, who says he doesn't see his family for four months. The children during the pandemic were very, very sensitive to that and were writing Christmas cards and Easter cards and with uh, doctors on top of the vessel, drawings and nurses and saying, wash your hands and be, please be careful. We can't wait to meet you. One child said, when, when it snows, does the vessel stop? Does it stop working when it snows? It's really very interesting how the children's minds are working. Could you please working. try to conclude? Yes, my conclusion is that well, when it comes to sustainability, basically, that's what I want to say, that these young people, what Project Connect is doing, my, the business that I created in Greece from 2015, is to make sure that we have cultivated the standards and the aim for excellence which is found in shipping industry um, in these young children's uh, minds. And we plant the seeds of maritime because maritime is really about life. It's a con connecting cultures, connecting ports, and the children learn so much. And they actually, we take, we do three times a year um, surveys with the children and the teachers, and we find that at least 49% of the children who, who partake in this adoptership program uh, want to be in the field of shipping, which is business, it's commerce and trade, and half of them also want to be captains and travel the world. And inclusive, inclusivity and gender diversity, women. I mean, that's 50-50. It's young girls want to be captains and they want to work in shipping. So um, I want to applaud all of you women who have jobs, uh, create, created your own businesses, and you have children and families, and bravo to you because it is a hard job. And don't forget you are CEO of your home, whether or not you have children, always. Thank you, thank you for your, uh, let's say, inspiring speech. Thank you. And uh, now, now let me give the floor uh, to Laurie McNeil, international media marketing and branding expert. Do you prefer here, the floor, or there? Okay, the floor is yours, great. Thank you so much for having me. It is an honor and a privilege to be here in Greece and meeting all of you, which I've received such a warm welcome. Thank you so much. I am actually from Oregon in the United States. It took me almost two days to get here, and yeah. I arrived last night. And um, it's, it's an honor and a privilege to um, be here at, at WEF and to be here on the inaugural event in Greece. So thank you so much. So I thought in order to tell and share with you a little bit about my um, experience and my thoughts on um, women in leadership and sustainability, it might be beneficial for me to back up and tell you a little bit about my journey in leadership and how I got to where I am today. I actually grew up in a very, very um, poor environment with um, seven of us living in a one, uh, a conversion, 1984 conversion van. So I actually grew up homeless and through a deep desire, and if any of you are familiar with Napoleon Hill's work, the deep desire within me that there was something else out there in the world that was for me, even though I had no idea what it was, but I was, a, but I was determined to figure out what that was and what my place in the world was. And so through a navigation and exploration process of all kinds of different opportunities around me, I then began to, a very early, early passion for entrepreneurship. So in order to help my family with basic needs, I actually made and sold barrettes at Christmas bazaars. And I learned a lot about product placement and service in talking with the customers at just uh, at six years old. So at six years old, in order to help my family, I learned what size barrettes, what color barrettes, how to price them, all of the different things. Now, some of you may be thinking that I was so young. How, how could this have been such an impactful moment? I'm here to tell you that it was. And it was the beginning of a journey that I was going to continue going down that I still, to this day, continue on as an entrepreneur. I then began as the years went on, and my family then was able to move into a one-bedroom uh, travel trailer, and then years later, my first stick-built house. My family went on this journey as we, 
as we learned and grew along the way. But what I didn't realize was that a young girl in a family of seven, I was the silent leader. I was the one that was mentoring and leading my family that was actually changing my family tree in ways that I didn't even understand at the time. I was the first one in my family to go to college. I've graduated with three bachelors, three masters, two PhDs, and 25 certifications. And I have... Thank you. I, I have a PhD in business and another one in education. So everything that I do is about business and education and helping people become the better versions of themselves so that they then can serve other people and continue on that ripple effect. My brothers and sisters now have also gone to college and continued that ripple effect within my family. So I have started international travel and teaching around the globe since I was 18 years old. I love what I do. I stumbled across media and branding and marketing at a very young age when I took out my first business loan and my first business presentation when I was only 11 years old. I, I got my first business, basically sold that for way more than I could even imagine at uh, 13 years old went on to continue leapfrogging this a beautiful dance between business and education. I've now been doing what I do for over 28 years, and that is traveling the globe, helping entrepreneurs get from wherever they are to where they want to be, and understanding that wherever you are in the world, no matter what your circumstances are, no matter what your resources are, no matter how you think of what you have or don't have, you are absolutely capable of using the internal tools within you to solve external problems in only a way that you can. It doesn't matter if you are in the same industry as the person sitting next to you, you are uniquely qualified to do only what you can do. And the world is waiting for you for you, for you to show up. And there is a, there's this amazing story I want to tell you really quickly. When I, was, when I was much, I was maybe 23 years old at the time, I had the opportunity, I was asked to mentor this young girl who was going through, she was only about nine, was going through a, a very difficult uh, situation through the divorce of her parents. I met with her every week. I mentored her. I listened to her. I was a shoulder for her to cry on, and she developed this um, amazing ability to push past her circumstances that she didn't feel that she had control over. It was years later, after I'd have my son, and my son's almost in college now, it was years later that I was volunteering at a school that she came up to me and she was watching me for about an hour, and I was noticing that she was watching me, but I didn't recognize her. And she came up to me, and she said, are you Lori? And I said, yes. And she goes, do you remember me? And I said, no, I'm sorry, I don't. And she said, I just want you to know that you changed my life. I am a better mother and a better wife because of the skills and the mentorship that you gave me when I was only nine years old. That moment was an amazing recollection and a pivotal uh, moment in my life of remembering the seeds that each of us have to plant into someone else. You never know the ripple effect that you are going to have on the heart, souls, and minds of everyone around you. Every action, every attitude, every spoken word, you have the opportunity to plant seeds every single day. Never underestimate the power of those seeds and how the ripple effect from you changes lives in your family in your community, and across the world. I am honored to be here. I would have never guessed that a young, poor girl, homeless, would actually have received, earned multiple 
degrees, global recognition, two presidential honor awards, and so, so, so much more. If I can do it, every single person in this room can do it, and every single person has the power within, within you to serve the world in only a way that you can. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for uh, sharing with us your amazing and inspirational story. Okay, uh, Perimenu Metin, uh, we can start the discussion since we have 45 minutes left. Okay, what I suggest to encourage the discussion among you, I could set the floor or also we can have Q&As, whatever you prefer. Should I start with some questions or you would like to take the, the lead? What do you prefer? Yes. I'll start. Okay. Let's start uh, with you and with your amazing story. It was really inspirational. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is what about the country you are from, the legal framework, the opportunities, the... Um, uh, you come from America. Many people believe that America is a bad country. Other people believe that America gives the opportunities, United States, of course, gives the opportunities in order to change your life. Because we have many women among us from countries that they don't really have the paths, the opportunities, the educational system, um, let's say the legal framework. Um, what is your comment on that? If you were in a different country, of course there is internal need for survival or lack in life, but what about the framework? How can we overcome that? Can I add something? Yes, yes, of course you can add. Especially, I was uh, uh, amazed. The, I was amazed with the fact you said that uh, you... Closer. You got your first uh, loan in the age of uh, 11, mm. of 11. I can assure you that this could never happen in Greece, yes. even now, never. Exactly. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> in any country. <laughs> no, in any. We, we would like to have some details. On this. Yes. <laughs> yes. So um, to, to your point, um, I was 11 years old. I took out my first loan, gave my first bank presentation that was co-signed by my mom because I was not, I was a minor, I was underage. Um, it was still a huge risk for my parents, for my mom, um, because we, of the way that we had grown up and not having money. Um, but she had a belief that, um, that I was going to make this work, and she had more experience than I did, and so she helped me at that time. Um, so perhaps in the US, there are different opportunities, but there are also, in my story, it's also important to note that because I grew up the way that I did, I lived in, I was homeless, I lived in poverty. That was all I knew. That was all I knew. We were in a very close-knit um, environment where I didn't have a lot of friends. I didn't have a lot of resources. I didn't have a lot of connections. And so um, if I think about it in terms of other countries that maybe don't have a lot of resources. They, don't, they feel like there's not a lot of options, but they know that they want to do something even if they don't know what that is. So I'm a true believer in that, in that desire and in that vision and in doing what you can and starting with whatever you have, wherever you are. It can be having that conversation with someone in your local community, your local neighborhood, someone that you just have that, you just never know the ripple effect or the ideas that are gonna surface when you have that faith over fear and you take that next step, even if it's super, super scary. And sometimes it's very, very scary. But I think about it, that journey as a flashlight in the dark. The flashlight is designed to illuminate only so far, only another step or two. And when you take that next step and you make that decision, whatever that is, then that flashlight, that step, is illuminated in the next step. 
So you were created to do exactly what it is that you were doing. Here's the beautiful thing. You can't mess it up. It's not possible for you to have all of the information before making a decision. How many of us in our lives or have heard people say, well, I need all the information before I can decide, right? A lot of people think that. Here's the beautiful thing about that process. It's actually not possible because you don't know who you're going to meet. You don't know the, the resources that are going to surface. You don't know the aha moments that you're going to have. It is not possible for you to have all of the information before making that next step and making that next decision. You make the best decision that you can with the information that you have at the time. You learn from that and you keep going. So it doesn't matter where you live in the world. It doesn't matter what your resources are. You start with what you have because I started with nothing. So wherever you are right now, push yourself outside of your comfort zone mm -hmm. of whatever that is that that might be for you and take that next step and you be the flashlight in the dark. Yes, uh, this was, I think, uh, the crucial thing. You start with what you have. Th this is very important. Never to say, I, I can't, I don't want, I'm afraid. Start with what you have, please. Yeah. yeah. The mic, your mic, I want, please. I want to add to that. I, the, what, you, what you said, Laurie, is exactly in a smaller context my story. Uh, my, when I said my father had a store, a friend and I, we stopped him being a shoemaker there, a shoe repairman. He had a small sh store, and I didn't have the money to buy uh, merchandise, but I had worked in a boutique, and I, I saw a, uh, this is, goes to the young women here. I, mm -hmm. I worked in a boutique, and I saw a magazine, a uh, W magazine, which was about a wholesale, mm -hmm. And I put an ad in there that there's a shop opening in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and whoever, whichever designer had clothing, they wanted to put it in there. So in other words, I filled the store up without mm -hmm. paying any money mm -hmm. and had merchandise, which as it was sold, I would pay mm -hmm. the designer. So you could always think of creative things. Uh, and that's the light. That, that's the flashlight. Because I was like, okay, we have the storefront, but we don't have the merchandise, and we don't have the money mm -hmm. to, uh, to uh, buy the merchandise. So how are we going to make this store how are we going to make this boutique? So I was 24 years old at the time. I learned I was selling Avon at 13 mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. uh, Bensers, and they had marketing courses for us at 13 years old. You know, But it, that, it is, though, when you have an, uh, a need. It's always mm -hmm. a need that pushes mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. also. You know, we have financial need, too. Thank you. Thank you. Let me give the floor to Mrs. Hadzipetru. And uh, how... Can we overcome these obstacles? Not, not only our internal obstacles. I think we all have the, the will and the power. The framework, the, the society, the institutional obstacles. Well, what we heard, and uh, primarily of the, those two ladies with red, that is a color of passion anyway, uh, my feeling, what I received, is a passion. Yeah. So in Europe and in Greece, I, we, which is you know the more uh, uh, the, the areas that we feel more comfortable, we g girls, little girls, are at this uh, in the last uh, 40, 50 years encouraged academically. So we receive degrees, we excel academically, we see that. Uh, uh, more and more women in judges, uh, in doctors, uh, engineers, in every sector, in finance community, in every sector, but within a framework. And the f this framework does not entail risk. So risk is something that it's not in the mentality of the what we call mature uh, um, communities which is a European community overall and in Greece. How we can overcome it? We could create, in a, we could start with education. And we can, uh, what I heard is encourage entrepreneurship at a very early stage and secure the quota that we heard now that is on the board level, but it takes like 20 years to become a C level. In between, you have to build a mentality, you have to build a passion, you have to target somewhere. 
So when I was asked, primarily by my son, why we have a quota in uh, ladies and uh, you know females, whatever, in board participation, whatever, it's not because it's fair. It's not because it's um, you know inclusivity and whatever. But it is because we need to show that there is a potential that is here. So what we call create the path so that there is a potential and they don't experience the glass shield in every move of their life. It is institutional. So coming to the loan, because I know it was the mother that took the loan. <laughs> but in Greece, there is no way that a six-year-old will drag the parents to the bank and the, the parents will endorse a loan based on the passion of the child. So what we miss in our communities it's is... It's not only the passion. Uh, there is a, a real need, let's say, because yes. in Greece, uh, thank God, let's say, not many six-year-old girls, you know, are in such poverty. But as you remember on the charts yes. that I show you, yeah. it's very clear that on the regions mm -hmm. of this planet that uh, are less uh, mature, financially-wise, mm -hmm. which is not Europe, mm -hmm. which is Asia, mm -hmm. which is Africa, the entrepreneurship mentality is higher. Yes. To the, f the fact, the only problem is that in the States, mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to exercise mm -hmm. your dream and passion, whatever, in high profit sectors. Yes. Whereas in those regions, you exercise your entrepreneurship mm -hmm. on selling uh, uh, low margin uh, goods, let's say, like, I don't know, clothes and um, handmade mm -hmm. things and whatever. Whereas in the States, you can position yourself and you can set your dream in, in high profit uh, sectors. But I was highly impressed by your passion, ladies. Thank you very much. And it, it's also, I forgot what, oh, it's, it's also a mindset. Sorry, uh, let me interrupt our discussion uh, since uh, our uh, minister, Vice Minister Katerina Papakosta Palluras, is the Minister of uh, Social Cohesion and Family, is here with us. Uh, they all have very strict program today, so let's give her the floor, and after we carry on with our discussion. Your minister, dear minister, the floor is yours. Highly impressed. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. I, I believe that it's, you know, the stage is a completely different. It's a mindset because you may have to remember America was built on Europeans. Καλημέρα σε όλου. Θα μου επιτρέψετε να μιλήσω στα ελληνικά. Είναι ιδιαίτερη τιμή και χαρά για μένα να βρίσκομαι σήμερα εδώ σε ένα. Ε, κύριε Μούτσο, ελάτε μετά να κάνετε ένα summing up για το international κοινό μα. Ευχαριστώ. Ακούμε. Μετά, όταν ολοκληρώσω. Ακούγουμε. Ναι. Τώρα. Τώρα. Ωραία. Είναι ιδιαίτερη τιμή και χαρά για μένα να βρίσκομαι σήμερα εδώ σε ένα τόσο επιδραστικό φόρουμ, το οποίο θεωρούμε πραγματικά... Είμαι και λίγο ψηλή. Εκεί, μια χαρά. Είμαστε καλύτερα τώρα. Ωραία, τέλεια. Στο πολύ λίγο χρόνο που διέθεσα, θα μου επιτρέψετε, απλά είναι πολύ βεβαρημένο το πρόγραμμα, άκουσα μια πολύ ενδιαφέρουσα εμπειρία από την αξιότιμη κυρία. Και νομίζω ότι είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό για την κάθε μία από εμάς να πιστέψουμε πρώτα εμείς από όλε τον εαυτό μας και το πόσο σημαντικό είναι πραγματικά να γίνει κατανοητό σε όλους ότι οι δυνατότητες τις οποίες διαθέτουμε είναι πραγματικά τόσο, τόσο έντονες, τόσο δυνατές που δεν υπάρχουν όρια έτσι κι αλλιώς το ότι μπορεί να πετύχει κάθε μία από εμάς. Σας μιλάω μια γυναίκα η οποία επίσης έχει ξεκινήσει την πολιτική της διαδρομή και όχι μόνο από τα χαμηλότερα κοινωνικά στρώματα, επενδύοντας πρωτίστως την εκπαίδευση, η οποία ανέκαθεν για μένα και για την, για την οικογένειά μου, αποτελούσε την, εκείνη την οπτική ότι αποτελεί τον κοινωνικό ανελκυστήρα προκειμένου να επιτύχει ο καθένας από εμάς τα όνειρά του και τους στόχους του. 
Ω Υφυπουργό Κοινωνική Συνοχή και Οικογένεια, ω Υφυπουργό Αρμόδια για θέματα ισότητα, για θέματα ανθρωπίνων δικαιωμάτων και όχι μόνο αντιμετώπιση ενδοοικογενειακή βία και τη έμφυλη βία, το τελευταίο χρονικό διάστημα εστιάζουμε ιδιαίτερα με την Υπουργό την κυρία Ζαχαράκη σε θέματα ενδυνάμωση και ενίσχυση τη γυναική επιχειρηματικότητα. Σε ένα μήνα θα καταθέσουμε στην Βουλή την κύρωση τη οδηγία, Ευρωπαϊκή Οδηγία 2381, η οποία θα ενισχύσει, θα βελτιώσει την εκπροσώπηση των γυναικών σε εκτελεστικές διευθυντικές θέσεις που τόσο πολύ ανάγκη το έχουμε. Ανεβάζουμε το ποσοστό. Είμαστε από τα λίγα κράτη που προχωράμε με τόσο γρήγορο ρυθμό στην ενσωμάτωση αυτής της οδηγίας. Οι μετρήσεις δείχνουν και τα στατιστικά και τα στοιχεία που έχουμε στη διάθεσή μας ότι τουλάχιστον από τον πρώτο χρόνο θα έχουμε 50 τουλάχιστον νέα διοικητικά στελέχη σε διευθυντικές θέσεις. Άρα λοιπόν μέσα σε όλη την υπόλοιπη προσπάθεια που γίνεται εννοείται από όλου του εκπροσώπους, επιχειρηματίες, πανεπιστημιακούς, από την κοινωνία των πολιτών, από όλες τις γυναίκες οι οποίες βρίσκονται στην αιχμή του δώρωτος, θα κάνουμε ακόμα ένα βήμα πιο δυνατό για να σπάσουμε τις γυάλινες οροφές. Αυτό σε συνδυασμό με το σήμα ισότητας που από την 1η Ιανουαρίου του 2025 θα την χάνει καθολική εφαρμογή, επιβραβεύοντας όλες εκείνες τις επιχειρήσεις οι οποίες ε, καλές πρακτικές οι οποίες αφορούν την ισότητα των φύλων ενσωματώνοντας τις πολιτικές, τις επιχειρηματικές ευκαιρίες, δυνατότητες προκειμένου τα δύο φύλλα να μπορούν να έχουν ισότιμη ε, εκπροσώπηση και όχι μόνο αντιμετώπιση που ξεκινά προφανώς από την ισότητα στις αμοιβέ, αλλά δεν σταματάει μόνο εκεί αλλά και μέσα από ένα πλαίσιο γενικότερο στήριξη τη επαγγελματική. Ε, Ζωής, έτσι ώστε αυτή να συναρμονίζεται με την οικογενειακή ζωή. Βλέπετε, για παράδειγμα, νταντάδες της γειτονιάς, ένα τελείως, ε, διαφορετικό, μια τελείως διαφορετική προσέγγιση που μπορεί κάποιος να πει πού αυτό συνδέεται με την γυναική επιχειρηματικότητα και όμως οι γυναίκες σήμερα είναι εκείνες που σηκώνουν το, το μεγαλύτερο βάρος προκειμένου να φροντίσουν να αναθρέψουν τα παιδιά τους, να έχουν μια συνεκτική δομή της οικογένειας, αλλά είναι και εκείνες οι οποίες φροντίζουν τους ηλικιωμένου γονείς και συγγενείς τους. Άρα λοιπόν το χρονικό διάστημα που τις μένει πραγματικά για να μπορούν να ασχοληθούν με τα δικά τους όνειρα και πολύ περισσότερο με την δική τους βελτίωση και δι' επιχειρηματικότητα είναι πολύ δύσκολο και πολύ ελάχιστο. Συνεπώ, οι δικέ μα πολιτικέ κατευθύνονται προ αυτήν την στόχευση να μπορέσουμε να βοηθήσουμε όλε τι γυναίκε να ισορροπήσουν και να μπορέσουν πραγματικά να έχουν τον χρόνο που χρειάζονται για να μεγαλουργήσουν. Σα ευχαριστώ πολύ για την δυνατότητα που μου δώσατε να κάνω αυτή την παρέμβαση. Εύχομαι καλή επιτυχία στι εργασίε του φόρου και κάποιο συνεργάτη μου θα μείνει πίσω για να παρακολουθήσει έτσι με πολύ ενδιαφέρον τα σχετικά συμπεράσματα και απόψει που κατατίθενται. Να είστε καλά, καλή συνέχεια. Να παραλάβετε και το βρέβαιο, Υπουργέ. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Ναι, 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 ναι τώρα μόλι. Υπέροχα. Να είστε καλά, Υπουργέ. Ευχαριστούμε. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Uh, Mr. Motsios is a great journalist also, apart from presenter and moderator. So he kept some bullet points in order to inform our international audience for the minister's speech. Thank you, dear minister. Thank you. Right, I will just try to uh, wrap up uh, what uh, the Deputy, Deputy Minister said. Uh, basically saying and uh, noting that um, it's a great honor to be here and uh, to such an influencing event. Uh, she actually mentioned the experience that you had, uh, basically saying that the capacities and possibilities that we have as humans are the ones that we really need to bear in mind and use them in actually achieving our goals. That is to say, that it is important to believe in ourselves and understand what capacities we have, what abilities and skills we have. Uh, she has started from very, very low, right down the bottom. And she understood from the early beginning that education is an investment um, in ourselves 
trying to use that in order to raise ourselves further up in the society. Uh, she also mentioned that um, in the next few year, well, in the next year, there will be the verification of the European mandate, which essentially dictates uh, women being positioned in managerial posts. So this is a great thing to to actually uh, focus on. And um, she also said that uh, the government is actually trying to raise the percentage of women taking managerial positions. So. Hopefully, next year, there will be more, 50 more women in managerial positions. Um, and she also mentioned that uh, there is going to be the sign of equality in companies, essentially saying that this is going to be used uh, to show that there is a diverse policy uh, of equality for women and men, and uh, that will uh, provide the companies with an additional if you like, uh, advantage to how they uh, make use of uh, women's and so on. Um, she also mentioned the new scheme of babysitters in our neighborhoods, which is a program based on women that look after our kids uh, by just getting some sort of salary. Women carry a burden. They need to look after the kids, they need to look after the elders, but they don't have enough time to uh, look after themselves and make their dreams come true. So the message is believe in yourselves and make your dreams come true, especially uh, when you just try to invest in yourselves. Uh, non don't forget that you're women, but you also have powers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. You're amazing. Of course, we have to believe in ourselves but uh, the institutions and the governments and the society has to help us. And see, it's not only because I really, really, really want it, I will succeed. <laughs> just, this is just a wish. <laughs> Libon, let me carry on with you, Effie, Mrs. Tritopoulou. Uh, I don't want to pose any specific question. I would like your comment on what has been discussed already. Um, well, thank you. I would like to start from some, something that the minister said before, because um, I think that uh, as women, we must believe in ourselves. This is the first point of starting um, a leadership, a business, etc. Because uh, we may don't have families like yours that support so much the kids, etc. Uh, we are raised up in a in an environment that may be not being so supportive with a lot of uh, stereotypes that, uh, okay, you are a woman, etc., etc. Uh, in uh, Afterwards, we may have uh, partners, men, that they don't uh, want to be with very dynamic women. They are not supportive. So it is on us to believe in our capabilities, to believe that we can we can go uh, ahead, and um, after believe, we must see what uh, other things we have to do. Uh, we must uh, rely on our skills, not only our diplomas and our knowledge. We must see, uh, see the skills that we have as women and with our personality, individual personality, for example, the communication skills, um, other skills, uh, to follow our instinct, to invest in ideas, in uh, innovative ideas. And uh, to, if we don't have a father with a factory, we must know that we must work hard, very hard, in order to succeed. And uh, what else? <laughs> I am... Uh, Oh, Let me ask you the question I wanted to ask you. It might be heard very uh, childish or very stereotypical. However, would ever uh, trust a woman to build a huge dam here in Greece, like in the outlander <laughs> paradigm? Uh, I want to build a huge, uh, let's say, bridge or a huge dam in Greece. And you are a great mechanical engineer. engineer uh, would you be the head of the project or not? Uh, Honestly. If it, if it is was on me, yes, no, of course. You, if you would be chosen to do that. <laughs> the, <laughs> this is another issue. Yes, if someone else 
uh, should uh, uh, take this decision. Uh, I think it would be still difficult. Why? Uh, because there is also stereotypes, as you can see, only 30% are still uh, women, and this percent that skip to be stable from uh, 2006. And especially in the constructor sector, okay, men uh, think and choose men uh, to build such uh, construction. Uh, but, uh, okay, if it was on me or uh, someone else, I think I will choose and I trust. And uh, I, can I say something yeah, more yeah. in the previous? Because I just wanted to finish. Uh, also, I would like to say that we may have ob obstacles in our uh, professional life, but we shouldn't give up. There should be always be reactive and to have plan B, plan C, and never give up. And finally, we will succeed. Other women did, so we can do also. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And let me give the floor for one more time to Professor Giannini. Ah, yet. No, no, no. She's, she's not here. <laughs> Are you here, Professor? Join us, join us, we still have time, Professor. Can, can Is everything okay? Okay. Can I just yeah, yeah, say no, something? No, um, when you asked, uh, I, don't, I don't remember all your names right now. Your name? Yeah, yeah it's okay. Effie. Effie. Um, my, immediately, when you were asked, it was like, why not? You know, that's all, that's all, why not? We're raised differently in America. Yeah, that, that's the difference. We're raised differently. We're raised to do anything my brother could do, I can do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Not no, here. No, I, Not I, I, yet. Mono I, 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 I couldn't go out with a lot of guys. My, my brother could go out with a lot of women, but I couldn't go out with a lot of guys. <laughs> Lipon, let me give the floor uh, from there, from here, whatever you prefer. Evgenia Giannini, Associate Professor of Technical Law at National Technical University of Athens. Please. From here, better. Elate, uh, apologies for your delay. There was a car accident in the National Highway, but I think now it's everything okay. Professor, the floor is yours for the next seven minutes, and after each of you has, let's say, one minute, I owe you one minute more for a last comment. Okay, okay. So where is the presentation? Okay, Tora, big year. Excellency is WEF 2024. Telia. Telia, thanks. Hola, Kalla. So we have the presentation? No. no. Yes? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We have gentlemen also? We do, we do, of yeah, course. Do. Okay. So first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the president and uh, the organizational committee for this invitation, for this event an event dedicated to the female entrepreneurship. So, um, entrepreneurship cannot be conceivable without the notion and the concept of social responsibility. So, today I'm here not in my capacity as a lawyer and professor, but as my capacity as president of the Excellencies, an NPO that has been established for a specific purpose and scope. Um, the story is long. Uh, I grew up in an Aegean island. Oh. And many years ago, I witnessed Which island? Naxos. Naxos. Oh, no, no. Uh, and many years ago, I witnessed the struggle of uh, numerous uh, high school graduates unable to pursue their studies at uh, the Greek universities. This is due uh, to the Greek insularity a phenomenon that is unique 
and is not encountered in other countries, uh, particularly in the European countries. So we don't have an experience how to manage all this. Um, and the question was the following. How entrepreneurship could uh, help address this challenge? So at the time, uh, the idea was the following. How to, how to promote and to develop a culture uh, supporting the high school graduates from remote islands in order to ensure for them uh, studies and distracted uh, from any other obstacle that uh, their origin, the islands, could pose. So uh, the idea of establishing an entity aimed to the social intervention was born. Excellencies was aimed and would like to ensure conditions uh, for these uh, young students in order to achieve academic excellence and growth and job opportunities. But uh, the scholarships, the financial support was, was not the only problem. We would like to, uh, to ensure and to provide to these uh, students uh, also uh, two other pillars like mentorship and uh, internship. So this student to uh, build a CV that could be, uh, could be, could be uh, the right uh, CV that could fit to the market they would like to, uh, to develop their uh, career. So we did. And the question is how we could raise the social uh, awareness. Uh, actually, the co-founders of this entity, Excellencies, we share a common passion, that is swimming. Mm. So since 2016, we have, uh, we have crossed the most challenging uh, straits of the world, like English Channel, like uh, Alcatraz, from Alcatraz to San Francisco, like Bosporus Strait, and also the most challenging straits of the Greek seas, the Aegean and the Ionian seas, like Aistratis Limnos, like Othoni Kerkira, like Ro Castellorizo, like Port of Naxos. Do I mean? uh, yes, on relay. Right. And every year we dedicate an annual swim of uh, approximately 40 kilometers to these students. So to support, uh, to support them in their studies. So we have three axes, sponsorship, mentorship, and internship. And what are the results? Let's see some figures in my presentation. So here you can have a taste of what are the enterprises that participate as sponsors to our, uh, to our program. Also, representatives from these, uh, from these uh, enterprises uh, play the role of mentors. So uh, the students can have a mentorship from, uh, from enterprises that uh, could help them afterwards to find a position in the market they prefer. Um, here we have the map of Greece, and you can see what are the islands that are supported um, actually, in the program, we have, uh, we have included only the islands that uh, have population less than 2,000 people. So all these islands that uh, the, um, the job opportunities that the, the student may have are almost zero. So all these students coming from these islands are supported by the program. Here we have the map of the Europe. Uh, Alcatraz is missing, so you can see the English Channel because it's the, it's the map of our, of, uh, our uh, swimmings. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have Bosporus crossing, Aistratis, Limnos, etc. And uh, little by little, I think that we will... Um, we you, will... you swim also? Yes, of course. Okay. And here I am in the photo. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, in the English Channel uh, crossing. So uh, totally, uh, all, uh, all the team, all the swimming team, has already swam uh, approximately 8,000 kilometers for training. And you have to add also the, uh, the races that are, as I said, approximately of 40 kilometers uh, every time. So here, 
uh, is a photo from the Academy of Athens because this entity was uh, destined to be awarded, recognized and awarded by the Academy of Athens uh, last December of 2023. This, is, this was my small presentation and I hope that I kept the time. And um, I would like to emphasize how entrepreneurship uh, could, uh, could uh, strengthen the society and the social cohesion through the social responsibility. So we have to keep in mind that uh, this is uh, a part of uh, our uh, activities that we should uh, already develop and to respect uh, the social need uh, from us to, uh, uh, to support uh, people that are coming from, uh, from remote islands or from re remote villages. Thanks a lot. Thank you very Thank much, you dear delayed. Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Professor. And this was an excellent paradigm on, uh, on what is taking place in Greece and how different the circumstances are. Libon, um, professor, I'll give you the floor for... Okay, we have 10 minutes. You have two, two minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, I think uh, one uh, up to two minutes to each of you, just, you know, for some concluding remarks. The floor uh, is not yours. Not exactly co concluding remarks. I have two remarks. The first one generated by the discussion is that according to my opinion, according to my opinion, uh, the problem still in Greece uh, uh, is not so much on the institutional level, but uh, on the um, social level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Both men and women are, um, uh, are subdued uh, still in uh, stereotypes. Mm -hmm. uh, women on one hand, although they are uh, legally and regulatorily accepted in every kind of institution, in every kind of uh, scale of leadership, uh, etc. Many times, uh, they don't uh, uh, use the chances they have. They prefer a more moderate uh, career. Many times, I have seen it in the in the university uh, where I have served now 40 years. Uh, when I started, I was one of the very few uh, women in uh, the academic uh, environment, but I was very lucky because a man was different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had a professor, a, a man professor, of course, much more aged than me in that time, who uh, looked at me as if I was his own daughter. So he believed in you. He believed in me, he loved me, he pushed me. I, I still remember, 40 years now, that he was uh, telling me all the time, uh, mm -hmm. do not uh, lose your time as an assistant, mm -hmm. prepare your uh, uh, thesis for a doctorship, you are, you, you are not less uh, good than uh, your male um, uh, colleagues. Right. And uh, this went on through all my career. Right. And the second remark? And the second remark, um, is uh, what uh, both the two ladies from the States have mentioned, and also Evgenia Giannini um, a little. Uh, it's uh, this uh, system of uh, mentorship mm -hmm. and mentoring. Uh, our society, as far as I know, at least in my surroundings, uh, has very few to do with uh, mentoring. I would like to ask you how this system of mentoring works. Mm -hmm. Not in psychological uh, aid, but um, uh, mentoring in uh, entrepreneurship, etc. To, to that. I don't yes, have uh, uh, just now not to try to open discussion because we said one minute and a half for a conclusion. Uh, you answer us. Uh, you answer us your con uh, t t your last remark, please. Maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. No, well, t for the mentorship, on our Project Connect has mentorship program. We connect with women in shipping also. Yeah. And the young students on the CV platform, they request a meeting with a mentor. So, and what happens there is the young person um, mm -hmm. is asking questions about the shipping industry and how he, can get, how mm -hmm. he or she mm -hmm. 
can uh, use uh, our network, and it's really specific. And, and of course, experiences. Each lady or, mm -hmm. or male shipping professional is giving information to that young person, and it's it really it's helpful. Mm -hmm. Great, Mrs. Giannini, Professor Giannini. Yeah, I will answer with a nice story, which is true. Mm -hmm. In the first uh, year of uh, the program, we uh, we didn't have uh, money, but to, uh, to sponsor only eight students. In the ninth uh, position was, uh, uh, was a, a, a guy, Yanis, from Furnus. Mm -hmm. He was very poor, but uh, unfortunately, his academic uh, performance was not so good so to be at the eighth uh, position. Uh, I was very, uh, uh, I, I was not uh, happy with this because I would like to, uh, to embrace this, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, uh, student. Suddenly, he loses his father one month before mm -hmm. we uh, would take the decision what will be, who is going to be our uh, scholars. Mm -hmm. So he took, uh, in our scorecard, he took some scores, some, some scores, so he uh, finally, uh, he uh, was at the, he took the eighth uh, position. What happened before, uh, after? We didn't have uh, scholars for him. So I asked from the CEO of one of the biggest shipping companies uh, in Greece uh, to, adopt his, to adopt this, mm -hmm. uh, this student from Furnus. And he said yes. And he said immediately yes. So the result is the following. Now he's working for this shipping company. Mm -hmm. he, he took all the internships he, uh, they, they, uh, they were uh, uh, offered to him every year of uh, his uh, studies because he, wa he, want, he wants to uh, study uh, as a captain, so to go uh, in the school for captains. And finally, he uh, is uh, the third son of this CEO. Mm -hmm. I, don't, uh, I, w I, don't, I don't like to refer his name, but uh, finally, this, uh, this man said to me, Yanis is my third son, and I am very happy to have this, uh, to have Thank Yanis uh, in family. So this is mentorship. And Yanis admitted that uh, this, uh, this uh, adoption has had exponential results to his family, mm -hmm. because he was, now he's able to support his siblings to study, and uh, to support his mother, who is living at Furnus, and there, the conditions now are not uh, ideal. So uh, you understand what is mentoring and how mentor mentoring works in uh, our entity uh, in excellencies. Great, thank you. Effie, your last word. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I would like at the end to highlight uh, that it is very significant to uh, to promote, to present uh, best practices and uh, women that uh, manage. Uh, and, uh, well, we have a lot of significant women uh, here, but uh, let me say uh, something uh, for uh, Professor uh, Maronpoulou. Professor Maronpoulou was the first woman that uh, managed to be the, to upgrade at the level of uh, professor at the Tec National Technical University of uh, Athens. Uh, Tonya, we follow you, and uh, thank you for all this uh, support and organizing this. Uh, and also, Mrs. Mor Moropoulou for Greece is, it's, let's say, an historical person. She has a profound history also in activism, and she had fought for her ideas, and... Uh, she is a very important person, an important woman. Bon, uh, Let's uh, finish, uh, Lori, with your last word, and after to give the floor to Mrs. Maropoul. Just really quick, I wanted to add, uh, a, before my closing remarks, I wanted to add that mentorship is a state of lifestyle, it's a mindset, it's a state of being. It is not a title, and it is not a program. There are a lot of wonderful mentorship programs out there. But as a leader, wherever you are in the world, whatever your capacity, whatever your resources, you always have the opportunity to be a mentor in anything to anyone at any time. 
So that's one thing I wanted to add to that topic. The other thing I wanted to just really quick implore all of you to really think about is um, when you're thinking about where you are and what you need to do to take that next step to push forward, I want you to think about your resources. So in addition to being a media branding and marketing expert, I actually teach a lot about legacy and what legacy truly is and what it is not and the steps that it takes to build a true global legacy that goes beyond you. And in that process, I teach about how to level up your resources, meaning there's internal resources, there's external resources. We all have so many more resources than we probably even realize. Mm -hmm. So to really understand what that looks like for you, and maybe that is a mentor, maybe Great. that is a coach, maybe that is a class, maybe that's um, you know, your own mindset work. Whatever it is, maybe maybe females need to be have more financial literacy or more economic, you know, understanding and awareness. Whatever that is that is going to push you forward in the direction that you were created to go, whatever right. that means, to not let anything stop you, but to take that action and filling in those gaps with leveling up whatever resources you need to make it happen. Thank you. Ωραία. Ε, Αθηνά, θέλεις για 30 δεύτερα όμως. Just for 30 seconds. Because it's 12 already. On mentorship. I, I uh, uh, incorporate whatever was already mentioned, but I want to make a last remark. Mentorship is part of the company's culture. Mm -hmm. So this is for all young women that I see in the back. Don't choose a company. Choose a mentor. This is what, what will take your career forward. It's very important. If you don't, if there is not mentorship, if it's not in the mindset of the company, you can't act it by yourself. Great. Professor Moropoulou. Thank you for uh, uh, the excellent examples. Thank you for the excellent examples of uh, women leadership, uh, either at the personal level or at the level of uh, uh, entrepreneurship uh, at the firm or at the institutional level. Και γυρίστε uh, λίγο για να σας να καταγράφετε και το. However. Δεν έρχεστε πάνω να τα πείτε καλύτερα. Όχι, όχι. Α, δεν ξαπλά γυρίστε λίγο να σας. However, what is important? What is important, uh, you noticed, uh, Athena Hadzipetru noticed that women are having leadership in uh, firms of low tech uh, because they are not interested in high profit revenues. Efi uh, Tritopoulou from uh, Engineering uh, uh, Women Association noticed that uh, women are taking their positions in uh, innovative uh, startups in firms concerned with uh, environmental and sustainable planning of development, uh, which is producing high revenue apart from uh, decarbonis decarbonization. So what is important from these two uh, paradox, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, acknowledgements is the fact uh, that women in leadership do diversify uh, the entrepreneurial performance and from these two different ends are developing a new scene of entrepreneurial work. Mm -hmm. So that means perspective uh, induced by women is diversified, but is winning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for your presence. Uh, it was an amazing panel. I really, I believe, really learned so many things. I admire you. It was a great honor for me being with you today. I have to leave because uh, I have to <laughs> to present a, <laughs> like a news bulletin. Thank you so much. And I give again the floor to Yanis.
Maria, just before you go, we actually have to uh, present the memorabilia to the ladies here. Yes. Um, yes. With the insights have been fantastic, and uh, for that reason, I'm going to invite uh, Evangelia Samoili. She is uh, <laughs> the uh, WEF Steering Committee Coordinator and WikiGR Secretary in General. So I would like to invite you here. And uh, any of the ladies here, you will pl please go downstairs, receive your memorabilia, take some photos, starting with Ms. Nicole Chu. Yeah.